hope you've all been doing good since the last time we talked. So today, we're going to discuss a topic that I feel very strongly about. Diet. This is not to say diets as in fad dieting, going on and off various trending diets as if they were stylistic choices like clothing, but rather, what food you put into your body on a consistent basis as a defining descriptor of a significant part of your being. They say, you are what you eat, and I take this as seriously as possible. Consider this. There are more cells in your digestive tract that aren't human cells than there are actual human cells in your entire body. And all of these organisms are entirely dependent on what you eat, both in their general state of being, and even exactly which organisms reside within you. Given that, diet is something that I believe should be taken care of with extreme caution and forethought. So anyway, this is going to be a decently long video, so let's get right into it. So let's take a seriously comprehensive look at human history, or rather, pre-human history. Upon the immediate diversion from chimpanzees, pre-humans were far more terrestrial and far less arboreal than our other ape relatives. This put us on the ground a lot more, and it put our eyes on food sources far closer to the ground as well. Eventually, we discovered that we could eat the roots of small plants, and that some of these roots were quite nutritious, albeit far more difficult to consume. Try eating a raw potato versus a fistful of spinach, and you'll probably understand what I mean. So, the pre-human solution to this was to smash what were essentially potatoes into rocks and mash them, and make them easier to eat. It's rather funny to think that we've been eating mashed potatoes for longer than we've been humans. However, it was the soon-to-follow carnivorism that would truly drive us to the extent evolution that we underwent. Relatively soon after we started eating these underground storage organs that were essentially potatoes and onions, we discovered something far greater. Meat. Initially, we were not hunting the prey ourselves, but rather acting as scavengers and taking from the apex predators of the time, mainly lions, cougars, and the like. Some of the earliest sets of stone tools found at pre-human grave sites, reaching back as far as 3.4 million years ago, among the remains of Australopithecus, would not have been sufficient for hunting. Rather, these early tools would have been suitable for cutting and processing the meat, but would not have been very well wielded by a hunter. Considering we have no claws or fangs with which to take down our prey, our bare hands would have not likely sufficed in such a task. However, it is not as if there wasn't plenty of meat to go around. It is documented that lions will leave behind a significant amount of their prey when they are done with it, because how else would the dreaded hyenas eat? So much so that, sparing the hard math, roughly 27 Homo erectus could be fed on the scraps left behind by a single zebra carcass after the lions were done with it from the meat alone for one day. We really just had to beat the hyenas to it. Further extrapolation on this was proposed by Blumenschein and John Cavallo in the 1990s that some of the earlier pre-humans, like Australopithecus, and even as late as Homo habilis, that retained a notable level of arboreal habitat could have even chased the leopard away from its catch. Leopards are solitary hunters, unlike lions, and they drag their prey up into the confinements of trees. Five pre-humans throwing sticks and rocks at a single leopard would surely be enough to chase it away and steal its food. While on the topic of Australopithecus, in 2015, Sonia Harmond of Stony Brook University found 149 stone tools dating back 3.3 million years in Lamakui, Kenya. These tools were found among bones that had cut marks on them, clearly indicating their use to slice meat from bones. These tools were confirmed geologically to have not been naturally formed and instead were manufactured by Australopithecus. Australopithecus is one of the first pre-human ancestors to exhibit genes of significant brain development, so it comes as no shock that it was one of the first to have been shown to actually manufacture better tools for use of carnivorous dietary behavior. Fast forward to 2.5 million years ago and the genus Homo emerges. Fast forward again to 2 million years ago, in 2014, Josephine Jordans of Leiden University and her colleagues proposed that the significant increase of the size of the human brain around this time was due to the ingestion of long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, resulting from the significant consumption of fatty fish. Fast forward again to 1.94 million years ago. In 2010, evidence was discovered by David Brown of George Washington University and his colleagues that shows human butchery of aquatic animals. These aquatic animals are known to have, and they still are, rich in docosahexaonic acid, this is one of the most abundant fatty acids in the human brain and is extremely important for brain development. Fast forward to 1.5 million years ago. Bones left behind by the likes of Homo erectus showed cut marks on places of the carcass that would have been the prime spots for the predator to have taken first. Further, there were very few, if any, teeth marks left on these bones. This suggests that, at this point, Homo erectus was the one responsible for preying upon the meat that they were eating. However, this should not be considered evidence that no bones left behind by man were touched by other predators. 
There is surely plenty of evidence to show human interaction with other predators, presumably in contest over the kill. Humans had, after all, in the past likely taken the prey of others, so Homo erectus was not exempt from having a hungry crocodile or perhaps a cave bear trying and taking his kill, and perhaps if he was alone, becoming a part of the meal himself. It is around this time that Homo erectus began to show significant signs of a more streamlined digestive tract. Erectus was the most carnivorous of the human ancestors, and this streamlined gut helped Erectus to extract more nutrients and calories from higher quality food sources. I will expand more upon that later. This streamlining of the human gut had several effects. First of all, given that the gut itself was smaller and more streamlined, general digestion took far less energy to accomplish. Further, given that the food being put into it was more calorically dense, there was an immense amount of energy left over after digestion, leaving Homo erectus with a serious energy surplus. The expensive organ theory suggests that by reducing the costs of our digestion, while also increasing our overall energy consumption, we had enough of an energy surplus to develop higher brain function. But there was a bit of a caveat. While our brains were growing in size, so too were our bodies. And relative to our bodies, our brains were staying relatively the same. So we were developing higher brain capacity, but certainly not to the level that we have evolved to today. So what happened? While there is some evidence for human-controlled fire that is as old as two million years, it is sporadic and not incredibly reliable. If we fast forward to one million years ago, however, we see stable evidence that humans had finally been granted the greatest gift Prometheus could have ever given us, fire. In 2012, Francesca Berna from Boston University and his colleagues discovered remnants of an ancient hearth deep inside what is known as Wonderwark Cave in South Africa. The hearth was located deep inside the cave, roughly 30 meters in. Berna and his colleagues concluded that any of the ash and other particles located that deep inside the cave would have been heavily worn down to smooth edges if they had been blown inside of the cave from the outside by the wind. The evidence showed, however, that since the remnants of ash particles left behind were too rough-edged to have gone through that, and thus they had to have been burned inside the cave where they lie. This ancient hearth was approximately one million years old and displayed human control of fire. It wasn't long after this discovery that at another site known as Gesher Benat Yaakov in Israel, Debris was discovered and showed evidence of yet another hearth, but this one had stone tools present that displayed clear evidence of them having been exposed to fire repeatedly. This suggests that this was not just used as a cooking spot at some point, but someone routinely came back to this site. This was someone's home, more or less. Think of what a hearth could do. It provided the ability to cook food, provided the user with warmth, provided a calming spot to exchange information with others, and provided protection from other predators. It was after the dawn of cooking our meat, and some of our other food too, that saw to the serious and magnificent leaps in human brain development. Cooking should be considered one of the, if not the, most revolutionary developments in human evolution. Cooking makes meat, and several other plant products, like the aforementioned underground storage organs, not only physically easier to digest, but chemically as well. This makes the nutrients and calories within far easier to extract. This coincides with the change in the human digestive tract when compared to the other great apes. Cooking, further still, renders some vegetables that would have otherwise been poisonous to us all of a sudden now palatable. Cooking provided, among many other things, less time culminating food, less energy digesting food, more energy left over from the higher quality food that requires less energy to digest, thus more time and energy to do things like think and build tools. Human beings have long since developed the need for cooked meat. We simply cannot extract the energy and nutrients we need without it, naturally speaking. An exclusively raw food diet provides nothing short of several deficiencies. For example, a 1999 study shows that nearly all reproductive-aged women who took part in a long-term raw food diet had either partial or complete amenorrhea. Veganism commonly exhibits deficiencies in calcium, iron, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin B12, omega-3 fatty acids, and vitamin K2. While several of these can be artificially supplemented into the diet, I think it says a lot that you would have to artificially supplement these nutrients into your diet. This suggests that such a diet is not native to the human body, and some of them simply cannot be properly supplemented in at all. So now that we have gotten through the ancient history of humans diverting away from chimps, let's take stock of what exactly has changed. The virgin chimp tummy versus the chad human gut. The chimpanzee brain consumes roughly 8% of the calories they consume, compared to the 20% that the human brain requires. The chimp diet is at most 3% carnivorous, and this consists mostly of insects and bugs. However, sometimes chimps actually do hunt. This isn't often, and they tend to hunt animals far smaller than them. Typically, chimps will hunt smaller monkeys. But when they do hunt, they treat every last scrap and flake of meat as if it were sacred. 
Chimp hunting is different from ancient human hunting, since human were, from the time we were actually the ones directly preying upon our prey, hunting animals far larger than ourselves. We had communities to feed, we had to have plenty to bring back home, and we had to save some food for later. We were using tools to process our food long before we were actually hunting the food ourselves, and chimps do not. However, like humans, chimps have, from Jane Goodall's findings, a serious lust for meat when they are on the hunt for it. Now to take note of the physiological differences between humans and chimps after we had diverted away. First, we need to take a look at the functions of the relevant organs in the digestive system, mainly the large and small intestine. The small intestine produces enzymes that break down the food and digests and absorbs the nutrients within. The large intestine absorbs any remaining fluids or water, compacts the leftover waste material into a solid, and excretes the waste material out of the body. Human beings have a massive small intestine relative to the rest of the gut. As well, humans have a relatively small large intestine. Gorillas, on the other hand, an almost exclusively herbivorous species, really put the small in small intestine and likewise for the large intestine. The gorilla's food does not have all that much to take from it, so the gorilla has the need for a smaller small intestine since the pathway of nutrient extraction is just going to be inherently shorter for lower quality material. It then follows that the sheer volume of food that a gorilla must eat is going to be immense, and they must have a massive large intestine to properly compact and excrete such an immense volume of food. Chimps are fairly similar to gorillas in comparison to humans, with a slightly smaller large intestine. I couldn't, however, find any empirical data on the size and frequency of gorilla and chimp bowel movements, so I guess you will just have to trust the logical progression on that one. Now that we have taken a long look to the far past, let's take a look at post-homo sapien development of the human diet. The Tsimane people of Bolivia grow lush gardens and are considered to be a subsistence agricultural culture. However, hunting and fishing still makes a significant contribution to their food supply. Even still, the most accomplished farmers, with the lushest of gardens, still hunt and fish and have a sense of absolute awareness that meat consumption is necessary for them. As one Tsimane man put it, my body doesn't want to survive on plants alone. The Inuit people of Greenland have an almost exclusively carnivorous diet. The climate they thrive in does not allow for much agrarian development. They have been able to harvest and consume some naturally growing plants, certain berries and tubers that can be found, but overall their diet is vastly carnivorous, albeit they have a habit of consuming a very high volume of raw, uncooked meat. Similarly, the Kyrgyz of the Pamir Mountains in Afghanistan live in a similar agricultural circumstance due to the high altitude they live in. They were, however, unlike the Inuit, able to domesticate livestock and make use of dairy products because of this. Similarly still, the Avank and the Yakut people of Siberia ate nearly a 100% carnivorous diet. These two groups, like the Inuit, were completely devoid of any cardiovascular disease. However, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Avank and the Yakut were introduced to the Western food markets, and then goodbye could be said to their heart health. The Bajau people of Malaysia fish for almost everything they eat. The Mayan people, whose diet consisted of domesticated animals and wild game, and a vast portion of agricultural crops, never had instance of diabetes until the 1950s when sugar was introduced to them. A bit of a side note that I find particularly interesting. The people of Ohalo II at the Sea of Galilee ate wheat and barley during the last ice age, approximately 10,000 years ago. Further, Grains have been shown in the molars and stomachs of human fossils as old as 40,000 years. So maybe, in some groups, grains are not such a foreign food after all. Generally speaking, human beings have evolved and survived on an incredibly varied diet. The Mayan diet, at least at some point, consisted of at least 70% maize. Contrast that to the Inuit, who eat almost exclusively meat and may have often eaten it raw. However, this poses a serious question that should not be taken lightly. Which of these very wide range of diets is the ideal one? Certainly there are some that are better and some that are worse, right? If there is one that is superior, I cannot discern which one it is. Perhaps the ideal diet varies, and each individual person should take a good look into their ancestry to see what they personally have evolved to eat. One thing is for certain, however. Consumption of meat has almost always, if not always, been present in both recent and far human development. So now we get to the part of the video that I personally enjoyed researching the most, but is going to drag on a bit and be a bit of a bore for those who aren't particularly interested in empirical studies and scientific data. So I'm sorry about that. It is no secret that the people who cast dispersion upon meat consumption have several health claims in their arsenal. So I'm going to address all of them, and then a few more that most wouldn't think to cast. Red meat as the cause of heart disease. A 2010 study from the Harvard School of Public Health showed that eating processed meats increased the risk of heart disease and diabetes by 42% and 19% respectively. 
However, the study also showed affirmatively that the consumption of unprocessed meat did not increase either. I am choosing to start with this study because it is one of the few studies I can find on any topic that differentiates between processed and unprocessed meat. And that is clearly a very important distinction. One other interesting note on the relationship between red meat consumption and heart disease. A Harvard Health blog post, yes, I know, it's a blog post, makes the claim that the real link between red meat and heart disease is that an increase in ingestion of L-carnitine. The claim is that L-carnitine is metabolized by the body in such a way that it produces byproducts that build up in the arteries, leading to heart disease. Likewise with the last study, however, the blog post makes it clear that the source material it uses can only confirm that this occurs in consumption of processed meats and cannot be affirmatively stated to be the result of consuming unprocessed meats. Further still, the blog post acknowledges another study which shows that people who were previous victims of heart attacks who take L-carnitine supplements actually have a decreased risk of having another heart attack. So at the very worst, this blog post is inconclusive on the matter of L-carnitine in red meat being the cause of heart disease. Cancer. This one took some digging to get to the root of the claim, and I'm almost certain that most people who make this claim don't even know why they're making the claim. But in any event, after much research was done, not my research, but the research of actual researchers, it was discerned that the viable pathway for red meat consumption to cause cancer lied in the sialic acid known as NAU5GC. NAU5GC is a sialic acid that is produced in the metabolism of most mammals, but oddly enough, not humans. So why does it cause cancer? After studying NAU5GC and its effects on the human body, it is known that the human body does produce antibodies specifically designed to remove NAU5GC from the human body. Oddly enough, this is the only antibody of its kind, called a xenoautoantigen. This might cause NAU5GC to be an inflammatory agent. Human beings produce a similar acid known as NAU5AC. This acid has been found on the surface of various types of tumors that can develop on human beings as cancerous. The thought could have been that since these two sialic acids are so similar, they could be related in the formation of tumors. So here was the study conducted. Mice that were known to have a NAU5GC production deficiency known as CMAH-1 were used. They were then given NAU5GC into their diet, but the form that they had to be given it was different from how it is consumed by humans. However, mice do not have the xenoautoantigen for NAU5GC, so this also had to be introduced into the mice's system as well. The mice were shown to have an increased risk of tumor development, specifically on the liver. Now, two things to consider here which contribute to the conclusion of this study. The mice were fed NAU5GC that was in a different chemical form than how humans consume it, and the antibodies the mice were artificially given were human antibodies. Further, the test was run again with several control groups. The WT mice, a different species of mice that has normal NAU5GC production, did not show any increased risk of cancer when introduced to the NAU5GC rich diet. Only CMAH-1 did. However, CMAH-1 already has an increased risk of liver cancer. So this study concludes nothing concrete, and the ones who did the study will claim this. There is more to say on this as well, I think. In humans, NAU5AC is formed inside the cell and is always flushed to the outside surface of the cell whenever it is produced. This is completely normal. The basis of the claim was that NAU5GC, a similar but still unique acid to NAU5AC, might be the cause of the cancer cell formation. However, it could perhaps be plausible that the cancer cells, or the cells around them, were merely producing NAU5AC like normal. NAU5AC is already produced by the human body naturally, so it can't really be linked to the consumption of meat. Further still, both NAU5GC and NAU5AC are heavily present in glycoproteins and gangliosides, both of which are known to assist in advanced brain development. So maybe they're not so terrible after all. Saturated fat and cholesterol in meat causes heart disease. This is a good one. This is the classic cholesterol kills claim. However, I will keep this one brief because I think it is relatively well known at this point. In 2014, a meta-study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine was conducted on 72 different studies with over 600,000 participants from 18 different countries all summed together. No additional studying was performed, but this meta-study reviewed the results and methodology of the 72 studies. It came to the conclusion that the conclusions of saturated fat being a lone cause for concern were unfounded, and that such a conclusion was reached based on failure to consider other variables. Essentially, this massive meta-study, and a meta-study of over half a million participants is no small task by any means, put to rest the old claim that saturated fat and cholesterol increase the risk of heart disease. Red meat, and specifically organ meat, causes gout. This one you probably won't hear very often. I found several studies that show that red meat consumption, specifically organ meat consumption, can significantly increase the risk of gout. 
This is due to red meats, especially organs, having exceptionally high levels of purine content. The body processes purines into uric acid, which then can form crystallized urate in your joints, and this is the known cause of gout. Several studies have been conducted on this matter. They all seem to conclude that consumption of red meat, specifically organ meat, as well as seafood, correlates to a higher risk of gout development in men who have no baseline history of having gout. I personally have a few issues with the studies I've found. For one, the diets were entirely self-reported, with no distinction between processed and unprocessed meat. But further, physique was an important factor of the risk, and the study used BMI as an indicator, and I personally disagree that BMI is a good measure of general physique. But in any event, these studies should not be ignored outright. However, there is a bright side to them. Dairy consumption was shown across all studies to significantly reduce the risk of gout, more so than meat consumption was shown to increase the risk. There are plenty of other causes for gout and plenty of methods of prevention. Two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar per day has been shown to help nicely as well. I don't want to come off as dismissive of the notion that meat consumption, but this was specific to red meats, organ meats, and seafood, can have a notable increase in gout, and these facts should be stated as such. One final point. One point that PETA makes on their website is that human beings don't have claws or fangs with which to take down our prey, thus we couldn't be carnivorous in any capacity. However, I don't think this is sufficient evidence. How long would it take to evolve claws? A few million years? That's not just adjusting existing mechanics, that's evolving an entirely new set of mechanics in the human physiology. However, adjusting an existing system, like the gut, to operate differently, I would imagine to be a far less time-consuming endeavor. As far as the fangs and claws go, we more or less bypass the physical evolution with the mental evolution of invention, spears, tools, etc. So I see no reason to believe that our lack of fangs and claws is indicative of our inability to properly process meat. So what was my point? To convince people to not be vegan or vegetarian? Hardly. I fully support the decision of any vegan or vegetarian to be so. That is a personal choice that I think should belong to the individual to make. And I'm not even saying that I think that this is a bad choice to make. My point was to merely display how eating meat is not just normal for human beings, but was a necessary faculty in the process of human evolution. Meat consumption should not be looked at as something immoral or wrong. There is nothing wrong in the inherent value of meat consumption. The meat industry and factory farming? That's a completely different question entirely, and I may address that in a later video. One other thing I would like to mention, since I'm just throwing in afterthoughts at this point, is that nobody seems to really be interested in discussing an active lifestyle as being a major contributor to health risks. Perhaps someone who lives an inhumanly sedentary lifestyle would benefit from a reduction of meat consumption, but perhaps someone with a more physically active lifestyle would far more benefit from their consumption of meat. Just a thought, I have nothing to base that proposition on, but it may be something to think about. But what else would I want to be taken from this video? Perhaps for every individual to take serious consideration into what they eat. It's important, and I think people should take more caution into what exactly they eat. Think of what our ancestors were eating and why they were eating it. Take your diet seriously. Ditch the processed meats outright. Stay away from them as much as you can. Isolate it to July 4th cookouts if you have to. Given that human beings have developed post-homo sapien in such a variety of ways, perhaps it would be wise to investigate what your personal ancestors ate and attempt to imitate that. Overall, I think your diet should be carefully considered. You should make whatever dietary choices you want. However, those choices are personal and should not be ridiculed as being immoral. If you wish to go vegan, please do. However, there is nothing immoral about making the choice to consume meat, inherently so. Human beings have had a long and treacherous evolutionary path. We have faced every monster imaginable since we climbed down out of the trees. We have tackled and dominated every ecosystem that exists on the planet with the exception of the deep sea abyss, and now we are starting to even look at other planets to inhabit. And meat and fire played no small part in getting us here. Well, that's going to do it for me for this video. Go ahead and pray upon that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this content. And please leave a comment below if you have any criticisms. Or if you don't, go ahead and leave a comment below anyway. So, until next time, make good decisions in your life. See you later.